And so believe it or not, we are at the halfway point through for our work group. So um, this is week six and we have a jam packed schedule here of things to review together. We have, um, I'm going to talk about where you should be by now and are you on track? Uh, we're going to talk about the promotion, marketing, and branding. <clears throat> and we're going to do some Q&A. Uh, and a lot of what I'm going to go through is from your reading for this week. The first thing I want to talk about is your current progress. Are you on track uh, with it, you know, to be able to get yourself published or almost there by the time we're done this, I want you to be able to be meeting key milestones along the way. So from the reading assignments, you should have gone through part one and part two of the book, which takes you through page 138, chapter 24. It sounds like a lot, but it they're very quick read. It's a very quick read. I think I read the whole book in a, a day <laughs> when I first got it. Um, so there's this book from Bobby Hinman. This is the um, the book that in, in week one, I told you to either download from Kindle or get, I like to have a physical copy because I bring it with me and read it and mark it all up. But there's a ton of great information and the way Bobby walks you through it, it's very simple and easy to understand. So you'll definitely want to stay, catch up with reading if you have not gone that far. Now, have you done your editing? So is your professional edit complete basically so um, everybody typically starts with a manuscript that's not quite ready to go um, the the items with um, so sorry the the editing one of the the first milestones is that you take your manuscript and you get it professionally edited so the um, I have a list that I posted on the Facebook group, which is um, a handful of editors that I can vouch for. And when I share resources with you, it's because they're people that I've worked with personally that I found very reliable, or they are people that um, other authors who I trust, and many of them have recommended this individual. So while I have not personally worked with them, I can vouch for the quality of what you get based on what I've heard from others. So um, Aranda says, I was unable to sign on during week one. Can you post the link or name of the book again? So Aranda, I want to take a second <clears throat> to focus on the YouTube group. So let me, I'm oh, sorry, the uh, Facebook group. So in the Facebook group, and if, if anybody here has not yet got access to the Facebook group, um, please let me know. It is um, something that as part of this, it's a, a companion, right? Everything we do each week is all posted in the Facebook group. So you'll notice when you log in, it goes into the units and we have a unit for every single week. So here's week one, and you can see for week one, um, order the book. So here's like, it gives you the tasks and activities that you should be doing for week one. So you've got the book, the order the book, um, the replay for week one, if you, if you weren't able to attend. So every single week, you'll be able to go in here and find the replay if you weren't able to attend live. And every week, I give you some discussion topics that I would like you to focus on, comment on, be thinking about, and we, we put them in the specific unit. Okay? Now, there, are, there is also a discussion tab, and I invite you to ask your questions, post, you know, or, or just discussion topics that we've not yet hit on uh, that you might want to get started with. Um, so it's, it's available there for you, but definitely take advantage of 
the Facebook group and I, I monitor it very closely. I answer all of the questions that are in there. And I think it's great to show the engagement and show that you are actually doing the things. Oh, I wanted to show you one more thing about this group. Sorry about that. Let me go back here for one second. With each and every activity, um, there is in the units when you're going through it, help yourself keep track of things because um, every single one of these things will have a button. So, okay, we say week six, research time. Okay, so here I talk about some of the research that you should be doing. Um, talk about, you know, best sellers in your niche. Now, when you've, you've gone through this task, you can click the done button. So you can see as I go through my earlier units, um, it shows me the things that I've already, already done and the things that are still waiting for me. So it's a great way to keep yourself on track to say, yeah, here are the things I should be doing for this week. Click, click, done, done, done. And then when you're signing in, it will kind of give you here at the top, it says two of six required units completed. So I've, I just haven't marked done on everything, but it will give you a sense of where you are and then what you need to do next. So it, it just helps you keep track of yourself. Okay. So take advantage of that and it will help keep you going. And um, I am also available, as I, I mentioned earlier, on Thursdays, I'm here for two hours from, 10, from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. If that for any reason doesn't work for you, I don't come with any agenda. I just come and plop myself down, start up the thing, and whoever wants to come and chat and get some coaching, I'm here. So if, that, if there's no way you can make that time slot, and, but you need one-on-one -on -one coaching, then reach out to me. We'll schedule something together because I want you to get the hand-holding that you need so that you can catch up, especially if you find yourself falling behind and you can't make some of the meetings, then I will help you get to where you need to be in order to be able to um, take advantage of the group. Okay, so mock-up created so we talked about a book dummy and kind of like how you go about creating um, the page turns put your text some images things like that to get give yourself something in hand that you can that you can show to um, focus groups or read to kids and show them what you're doing so we'll go ahead uh, so that's one of the things that if you haven't yet done that then walk through that um, the illustration brief where we talk and I have examples of illustration briefs up on the, the website. So we've got, um, you know, it, it has your text. It has your um, reference images. And this is an illustration brief is something that you're going to provide to your illustrator. Is there anybody that needs me to stop for a second and do a, a review on what an illustration brief is? Everybody good? Okay. All right. Um, and now, the once you're um, finished with your editing and you've got your professional edit complete, then you should also copyright your work because it, it protects you. It's better safe than sorry, right? You're going to be reaching out to professionals who are going to help you with different things. Maybe it's marketing, it's illustration, um, creating some different activities for you. So you're going to want to have all that, that copyright filed. And I have the step-by-step -step video that I've recorded. Um, if you prefer to get some hand-holding, drop in on a Thursday and we'll launch up your copyright and we'll walk you through step by step to get that copyright um, filed together. Okay. Well, so can I ask a question. Absolutely, Brie, go ahead. If your if your book is complete, we're gonna put that in quotes, and you file a copyright, can you then change it afterwards? Does that void the copyright or what does the copyright actually cover? Legal. Yeah, so it, I mean, it, you're you're copywriting your text, and if you've got some minor changes, I would say it's perfectly fine to to 
make some tweaks. If you find that it's a major rewrite, I would probably go back to them and update the copyright. So you can do that. And, it, and I, they may charge you again. Uh, I haven't had to do that. But even if they charge you another $55, it's better to, you know, re-copyright it if you've had, you know, a major change. But little tweaks to words, I wouldn't worry about at all. Okay. Do you already have the step-by-step? -step? This is on my agenda to complete. Are we talking about step-by-step -step for copyright, Leah? Yes. Okay. So yes, the copyright, I have recorded a video and I posted it in the Facebook group. So it's, I believe it's last week or the week before. Um, and I copy and I, I posted a link because what happened is I was going through it with one of the other authors. And I said, do you mind if I record this? That way, anybody else who's having trouble with copyright can watch this video. So she was fine with that. And so I saved it and posted it out for you guys. And we'll talk a little bit about that today. And if there's enough people that want me to walk through it after class today, we can certainly do that. Any other questions before I move on? Good. All right. Okay. So <clears throat> what you should start thinking about is selecting your illustrator. So when I'm create, getting ready to connect with a new illustrator, um, the first things that you'll want to do is get a non-disclosure because you want them to keep whatever you're sharing with them private and confidential. You don't want them, you know, posting information or sharing it out there. So you get that non-disclosure. Um, you can also get samples. If you are not sure if a particular illustrator is going to be able to capture the essence of your characters or what you want to accomplish, um, what I have done in the past and have recommended with other, other authors is get a couple of illustrators that you think you might, that might be a good fit and pay them both to do a sample. That sample that's provided to you could be anything that you decide it to be. Like it can be a copy of your character. Um, for me, I want it was important for me that the illustrator gets my dog correct because I've got it, it was the little Labradoodle series. So I wanted somebody who could really get that. And also, my grandkids are in the book. So I wanted somebody that could do a good job with the grandkids. So because I wanted, I wasn't sure which way, which way to go, I might, you know, just because you're looking at an illustrator's portfolio doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, just because they've done a great job with other people's characters, that they're going to be able to get what's in your head out on the paper. So I, you know, that's a process that you can work with them. You can, put together an um like just a couple of paragraphs about what you're looking for maybe a reference image and you can pay them usually it's fifty dollars on the low side to do a sample a full color sample or it's a hundred dollars on the higher side so i've i've seen both of those and it's worth paying the hundred and fifty dollars to get a couple of people to do it for you and then choose the right illustrator that meets your needs. And you'll get an opportunity to work with that illustrator. Now, a lot of people will tell me, I don't have any idea where to find an illustrator. Well, that's one of the reasons why I bring illustrators to this group. We saw in week four, we had, um, we had Pencil Master, so Pradeep Mera joined us and he talked about the illustration process. I also plan to bring Harry Avera, who is who did my most recent book, and he's worked on a couple of others um, who are already in the work group as well, and he's a phenomenal resource. I also have another illustrator who is, for those who are on a much lower budget and need to really watch the spending on illustration, I have another illustrator I will bring in who will 
um, share her experience and talk a little bit about what she does. And I'm thinking about scheduling them for next week, but the last two illustrators, so that we can have a little bit of an opportunity to kind of interview the illustrators. So if the timing, the timeline doesn't work out, what I may do is um, do an, um, an interview with them and then post the recording to the group so that you'll get an opportunity to learn a little bit more about them. And by no means do you have to go with my illustrators. I'm just saying that these are people I have personally, all three of these I've all personally worked with and I can vouch for all of them, their professionalism, their abilities. And um, from there, if you prefer to go to uh, a website like Readsy or Fiverr or just go into the Facebook author illustrator Facebook groups and you may see something posted by an illustrator that you really love the work and you think it might be a good fit you can connect with people through that that mechanism so there's plenty of things um, that can help you move forward with an illustrator and I'm here to help as well uh, I have a question from Lois is the Thursday session the same address as today yes you sh everybody who signed up for the class, I sent you an invite to the Thursday session. So it should be on your calendar. But if I've forgotten anybody, please let me know. If you don't see an invite for Thursdays from 8 to 10 uh, Eastern, then let me know and I will add you to it right away. Okay. So. Uh, as and we went through a lot of information about illustrations in the session that we did with Pencil Master. So if you want, uh, if you haven't had a chance to replay, he talks about um, all the process for illustrations. He talks about character design and storyboarding, and he even shares different styles. Um, you are welcome to download that catalog from Pencil Master, even if you wanted to use it just as a reference for another illustrator to say, look, this is the style I really like, then you can feel free to do that as well. Okay. Okay. Um, one thing I never uh, want you to do is move forward with an illustrator without a contract. Okay. I think so much about this. I feel so strongly about it that I actually share my template, my contract template with you. Now I know that there are different types of contracts. My contract template is for a work for hire. Uh, there are other types of contracts. Work for hire basically means you are paying the individual to produce artwork for you. That means you own the license to that artwork. You own the artwork. If you want to take that, take those characters and go and have a different person um, illustrate the next book, you can. If you um, want to create plushes or a coloring book or a different, you know, take those characters and use them in a new book, you, if it's a work for hire, you do not owe anything to that illustrator you're not required to go back to that same illustrator. So I know, I don't know how many of you are like me, but I like complete control. And I know that, you know, some will say illustrators should have that right to, you know, to share in the profits and other things. That's why there are other types of contracts available. Um, but I got burned pretty badly with my first book and I didn't know enough about contracts. And so that's why I created my own. And it, it, I spent about $10,000 in legal fees with an attorney to create an NDA, a contract, um, and to, to get my business license set up and all of that. So a lot of investment that I am happy to share these templates with you because I don't want to see you make those mistakes that I made. And that's what I'm here for, is to make it that much easier for others, not necessarily to profit or get any money back on it, but I want you to be able to be successful. So if you are someone that wants to do a um, profit sharing type of a contract, 
I do also have a template or a copy that my attorney worked on um, that I can also share. I don't put that up typically because not very many people have, have gravitated toward that, but I can absolutely share that with you um, because after having a, getting into a bad contract with my first book, I also had my attorney put that together as well. So in the future, if I ever wanted to move forward with that type of contract, I would have, I would be protected to the best of, of my ability. I'm going to stop there for a second. Um, any, any questions specifically on contracts? Okay. All right. Um, so you also, as part of the contract, let me, um, I also recommend that you put together the expected timeline. So get some information into the contract about when you expect things to be turned around, what milestones are going to be um, hit. And I try to tie payments around milestone delivery. I have had a couple of authors who have participated in this work group and they said I've got this great deal with this illustrator found them in XYZ place and they said if I prepay for this this stuff they'll give me 50% off well it still ended up being a couple thousand dollars for this woman and she prepaid and boom disappear so the illustrator can take your money and decide not to, you know, if they don't do anything for you, now you now your your hands are tied, right? Okay, you paid for all this money, now you're chasing this illustrator to get things done. Um, so that's kind of the dangers with unknown illustrators, um, people that you know I can't vouch for or that other authors can't vouch for. Um, check references. But don't, don't pay in advance for things. What I typically will recommend is a 30, no more than 30% at, on when you sign your contract. And then after sketches are complete, another payment. After coloring is complete, another payment. After the files are all delivered to you and you've got the files or the, your designer has the files, then the final payment. So I try to gauge it to no more than four payments, but three, at the very least three payments so that you have an opportunity to budget and you don't pay until you've got, you've got a deliverable of some sort. These are, are milestones that you expect them to meet. Um, one other thing is make sure all the financials are spelled out. So what is it going to cost you per page? What is it going to cost you for... If you want them to put together um, your cover design, um, a logo, like if there's other things that you'd like to get additional pricing on, put it into the contract. That way you have all of the information spelled out ahead of time. Okay. And I do, I, I'm glad to open up the contract and talk more in detail about the contract at the end of the class if you guys want to hang out and have more detailed questions. Um, Darlene says, I really liked how uh, Pradeep showed the differences in color and depth of the illustrations. Yes, that is an important part when it comes to budgeting for illustrations. Um, if an illustrator asks you what your budget is, don't be afraid to give them information about that. Because when you're going to an illustrator, if, if you tell them you have a hundred dollar a page budget, so, or like, Say so you say, I've got a $5,000 budget for illustrating this book. They will recommend different levels of illustrations that are along with that line of, of what you can afford. Now, if you say my budget is $1,000, you can, there are things that Pencil Master, that Harry, and that the other illustrator that I'll bring in can do for you at that level. Of course, they're not nearly going to be as detailed. They're not going to be like three-dimensional. It'll be very flat styles. You'll have less choices, but they can work within your budget. So don't be afraid to share that. If you just don't know what your budget should be, um, I can just let me know and we can talk and take a look at some different examples. And go look at the replay 
um, from Pencil Master because he does show some different styles and talks about the level of funding for each one, the budgets for each one. Um, so the more detailed and more like three dimensional and more characters you have, the higher that you'll pay for a good illustration um, of that. So it doesn't mean, low budget does not mean low quality. And that's one of the things that you need to, to realize is you can get a low budget illustration with high quality. April, I think you sorry. cut it. Yeah, sorry. My microphone every now and again starts to miss out. So, <clears throat> and it looks like I've got people that keep dropping and coming back on. So I hope there's not anything going wrong with Zoom. Okay, thank you. All right, so next let's talk about, uh, so we did already talk about storyboarding and sketching. So if you're at a point of selecting your illustrator, and I know this is more of a review, so I won't get too deep into this unless it's something that you guys need me to go in deeper. So what you can expect to see with, a with early sketching and storyboarding is a very high, you know, um, Pencil Master calls it scribbles, um, but to me this sketches, like very low level sketches. So this is um, sketches for my, my first book, Puppy Pickup Day. So I threw them up there as samples. So they'll go through that process of doing the sketches, work with you to tweak anything that, that you want changed. Then you'll get more, more finalized sketches where you know it's not just a scribble, it's more now taking their vision and making it look really good in a sketch. If you think that you are going to want to do a coloring book, let your illustrator know ahead of time because they can take those sketches and they might have to do things a little bit differently if they know that a coloring book is coming they will preserve those to make it easier and less expensive for you to do a coloring book so and that's that's one thing that um jarlene was able to do with her book ahead of time we've um and we started working on her coloring book as well with Harry Avera. And that's some of the stuff that we laid out right from the beginning is we wanted to make sure that we were able to do a coloring book. So um, next I'm gonna just touch on registering your copyright. So this is one of the things I said, if, you, it, you know, if you're at this point of the, of the class, you should be thinking about registering your copyright if you've not already done it. Now, here I have the, on this slide, I have the, um, ex the, the link to the copyright site. You, and you'll, it'll bring up this particular area here. So this goes directly to the copyright.gov site where you can log in to register your copyright. When you're logged in, so first of all, you're gonna need to create a new account for yourself. But once you're logged in, you'll see here, register a work. So that's where you're gonna get started. Um, and then you'll, as you register things, like here I had Puppy Pickup Day and my No Bullying Allowed, I have these two cases already open. So I can check in on them to see um, where my copyright process is. It will take you, it could take you months to get your certificate back for the copyright. However, you're protected as soon as you file for it. So you're good, but you'll get a certificate in the mail after you file for your copyright. And the copyright will cost you uh, $55 for the copyright. Now, if you are paying an illustrator to do um, work for hire, once your illustrations are all done, I would go back to the copyright um, area here and register another work and this time copyright the images. So you can either zip them up and copyright the images or just upload a copy of the book and, and select that you're copywriting the images. That way nobody else can take your images or you have a claim to, for your copywriting on the images. And it will cost you an extra $55 to do that 
Uh, I tend, some people will say, you can just wait and do it all together and just pay the $55 once. And that is true. You could do that. I prefer to err on the side of caution and have my text copyrighted so that nobody can do anything with it uh, or, or steal it or take it or anything. And then again, go back and, and update to get the illustration copyright as well. Uh, if you don't mind waiting and you want to do it all at once, then that is certainly an option. I just tend to be more cautious. Any questions on copywriting? And I will upload these slides so that you have information here. And as I mentioned, we do have the video where I walked through this um, with another member of the work group. Okay. One other area um, there's called, uh, and if you've gone through the reading, you will see that there's something called the Library of Congress control number. And this is something that um, all authors need within the US. If you're publishing within the United States and uh, you'll need to go to the Library of Congress, open an account, and then apply for the LCCN. It's a Library of Congress control number. It goes on your copyright page. Now, you don't have to act immediately right now to get it, but it must be done before your illustrations are complete because by the time you move forward with laying out the book, if you don't have this granted yet, now you've gonna, you're gonna be in a holding pattern and you can't publish your book until you get it. So just don't wait too long to get the LCCN number. Okay? There is, all right, let me just stop and ask, does anybody have questions, uh, any questions or comments before I move on to the topic of printing? Okay. Oh, April? Yes. Oh, hi, it's Colleen. So I just want to make sure. So the LLCN, um, you get through the Library of Congress website. Yes. And the CIP, where do you get that one? The CIP is also through the Library of, uh, I'm sorry, the, li <laughs> let me rewind. The CIP is typically also given, and CIP stands for Catalog in Publishing. And if you open and look at Bobby's book on the content, uh, table of content, I'm sorry, the copyright page, you'll see uh, it says Publishers Catalog in Publishing, and there's that section. It's a block of text that you apply for and you're granted and you put that also on your copyright page thank you for the reminder i wanted to touch on that as well so, so where do you find so if you are a large publisher you can get that through the library of congress mm -hmm. but because we are not we do not get approved if you're a publishing company like myself but you don't have at least four, three or four authors besides yourself that you're publishing, you don't qualify to get that uh, block granted to you by the Library of Congress. So what we've been able to do as indie authors is we have a different process that we use. And I can, I'll post information. I probably should have added a, um, a slide here, but there's a website you can go to. You pay $60 and you fill out the information and they will email you within a week with the CIP information that you can then paste in on the copyright page. So it's a way that we can get the information without going through the, the Library of Congress. And it provides some, um, it, it's, it raises the level of your book and provides um, libraries, when they see that information that you've got the, the catalog and publishing information, you've got your LCCN, it gives more legitimacy to books like ours that are self-published. So you definitely want to take that step. And I think I mentioned it's $60 to get the CIP block and roughly about a week. 
But where do you get it? What, what's the website? Yeah, there's a website. I, I don't know it off the top of my head, but oh, I'll, okay. def- I'll definitely get that and post it. Okay, and good. To the, um, and I'll add it to the slides, but I'll also post it in this week's activities so that you have everything that you need. And the ISBN is um, the, the myidentifiers.com. Okay. Correct. Yes. Okay, great. And um, I'll just touch briefly on ISBN. So um, Bobby recommends, and I completely agree, that if you are going to have a book, that you should own your ISBN. Now, some will tell you that you don't have to spend the money um, if you have a really tight budget and you cannot afford to get your own ISBN, Amazon will give you one for free. Same thing with other places you can go to publish. However, you can't ever take that book anywhere else with that same ISBN. And you're limiting yourself because no bookstore will buy, will place an order for a book that has a free Amazon um, ISBN. They want to see a specific ISBN that you have purchased. Again, it's about legitimacy for your book. If you want to get it into Barnes and Noble, you want to get it into Walmart and uh, retailers, then you do want to get your own ISBN. I recommend getting a block of 10. It is going to be $295 for a block of 10. So if you're if you're doing your first book, you're probably saying, wow, why do I need 10? Well, you're going to need at least two, right? Because you've got an ebook, you've got a paperback, probably a hardcover that you want to do. For the price of two, you can get 10. So why not get the 10? Because um, let's take an example of my first book. I did an ebook, softcover, hardcover. Um, I did an audio book, a coloring book, five. So I... I had five different ISBNs that I used. By the time I got to book two and did the same, my 10 ISBNs were all used. So you're going to want to get that block um, of 10 and go from there. Of course, it's a lot less expensive if you want to buy a thousand, but I don't think any of you are ready to do that. (laughs) That's the next bulk. Um, Any questions about ISBN? Oh, Lois is correcting me. It's five ninety five for a hundred. Oh, 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 good, good, good. Thank you, Lois. Five ninety five for a hundred is the next. Um, yeah, if you're gonna spend two ninety five for for ten or five ninety five for a hundred, you can definitely, um, you know, buy more if you know this is what you want to do. Um, but if it's your first book and you're not sure how this is all gonna go, then Grab 10 and, you know, go from there. Okay, guys? All right. So I'm going to switch gears and talk a little bit about printing your book. So some of you um, may want to focus on print on demand. And I'll talk a little bit about print on demand versus um, actually going and having your book printed by an offset printer. There's You can have printing done within the U.S. or outside of the U.S. There's lots of different options, and it's always good to really do some research. When I started this, um, my first book, I did have books printed, hardcovers printed, and I printed them in the U.S. The reason I chose to do that is because turnaround time was really important to me. I could not afford three months worth of waiting for a printer in China to set to, to run through the process and then ship them to me on a slow boat from China. I couldn't afford it because I was, my book was released in October. It was done in October and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't going to lose out on December sales for Christmas. So Besides that, I also really loved the fact of being able to print inside my book that it was proudly printed in the USA. I love that. And I, I feel strongly, I know others feel strongly about um, being able to keep things within the US. So 
The difference in pricing though is pretty big. I mean, you could get for a couple of dollars something that is going to be printed in China or India, um, a couple of dollars per book or less. And when you're going with the US, you're probably looking more like three or four dollars. So it's, it can be um, a significant difference in pricing. Uh, turnaround time, if you're doing it in the US, you're probably looking at four to six weeks to get your books printed. Um, if you're looking at outside the US, it's, you need to budget three months to get your book printed and then shipped to you. And I would actually um, add to that because of what's going on with the uh, virus right now. I worry that there are a number of individuals that are being quarantined and people are being asked to work from home. But there's a big impact in the printing industry right now because of this, because they can't work from home. They need to go into the office. They need to go into the printing company to be able to print the books. So if I, I believe that there's going to be a great impact on um, overseas printing as a result, both for, from, I think from the turnaround time, you're probably going to see lower prices because people are going to want the work and want, typically they require 50% up front for you to pay them. But if the virus means that it goes from three months to five months to get your books, then you know you've already put out 50% of the money and now you've got to wait five months for your book. I, I'm not saying that's going to happen, but I just feel like it's very possible to happen. And I, I posted in our Facebook group today, I posted an article uh, from uh, a magazine that talked where they talked about the that they also feel like it's going to be a big impact on the, on the printing industry because of the coronavirus. So just something to think about as we move forward. When we talk about print on demand, what does that mean? So if somebody goes to order my new book, my uh, join the club, I have, I've not printed it in hard copy. I've, I left it as paperback and ebook doing print on demand with Amazon. Um, number one, I didn't want to invest a huge amount of dollars, thousands of dollars to print hard copies of things before I have an opportunity to really test the market. Are people going to like the book? Is it going to sell? Um, it could fall flat. I don't know, but there are some, you know, important um, people that I trust uh, that are authors who have been doing this an awful long time and they've started kind of introducing things into print on demand as a way to prove out its um, marketability and sales before they then invest in a print run. So I've decided to do the same with my second book. Currently, um, so when somebody goes onto Amazon and orders my book, my paperback, it's going to give, Amazon will take the order, print a copy of the book, and then send it to them. I'm not, I'm not housing any books here. I'm not fulfilling anything. Amazon's doing all that. And they pay me a royalty each month based on, on the sales that are coming. So that's what print on demand is. With KDP, that's uh, Amazon's print on demand. It's Kindle Direct Publishing is what KDP stands for. They, through KDP, I do my eBooks and my paperbacks. You can, if you want to do a hardcover print on demand, then you can also have that done through um, Ingram Spark. And so I also set up a hardcover through Ingram Spark. And when I work with my graphic designer, I just make sure she gives me the ebook, the paperback, and the hardcover files. And I get everything pulled together. Um, if people want to pay for a hardcover book, it's going to be more expensive. And I won't get as much of a profit as then if I was to do it 
you know, in bulk, a bulk shipping order. However, um, I don't do a lot of um, uh, public events and things like that. So I'm not, I don't need like a bulk bunch of books here to sell. Uh, so for me, it was a good choice. For those of you who see yourself as doing a lot of events and uh, you want to have copies for yourself, you can order author copies from both of those sites. But of course, you're going to pay more than you would if you were doing a print run of a thousand books. So I'm going to stop there because I gave a lot of information and I want to just see if anybody has any questions on printing. What is the, um, the royalties for KDP and Ingram Sparks? How much do they get? It completely depends on your book. Oh, it does. Oh, the okay. size of your book, how many pages. So um, the good news is we can go through and, you know, figure it out. By, if you just create an account and you kind of play around, they, they have calculators for okay. both Amazon and Ingram Spark. I will try, I'll make a note for myself to put the calculators in our Facebook group so that you can figure out what your royalties would be. Um, I'm going to write that down. That'd be so, you're, you know, if you're, for example, <clears throat> um, Tanmoy and Rudra, who just, just published their first book, they're going to do some, they want to get some um, printing done. But if they're looking at print on demand, um, they have, you know, basically the same number of pages as what you would have, but their book is smaller, like smaller in size, because it's more, it's more of a middle grade. Um, book. So it's for older readers. There's less, there's less images and the images are black and white inside the book. So when black and white printing um, or a middle grade book with less images, it's going to cost less to print. So that means there might be more room for you to get more of a profit or royalty out of a book like that versus, and then there's a number of different different sizes of books eight and a half by 11 is probably you know is standard um, a4 paper size that will be less expensive than trying to do like some of the odd sizes so there's just a lot that goes into it and you might want to play around a little bit with the different options to see what what the um, royalty would be what I can also do is I can share Royalties like my book is eight and a half by eight and a half. Um, here's what my royalty is for paperback. Here's what it is for my hardcover. And that many of you are have chosen that size book, so I can share that that those level that level of detail with you as well. Okay. The other thing I want to also uh, talk about is, um, so I, I have some things here to share. Um, you guys have all met Pencil Master um, in when they, we talked about illustrations. Um, he sent me some things because he has a printing partner in India. And um, he said to me, I can print books in India. And if you know of any authors that are in need of printing, let me know. And I said, I'm sorry, pretty, I just don't work that way. If I'm not holding something in my hand, I cannot endorse it. If I have not seen the quality myself, I cannot share and, and provide that option to anybody. So he sent me some stuff. This is, this is a book, um, 300, over 300 pages, and it was printed in India at this partner partner organization and for a, a book that has 300 pages look at how beautiful that binding is um, it's amazing quality uh, color and quality is beautiful and the thickness of the pages is incredible and um, what they they call you know the thickness you can have up to a, up to a couple hundred for your I'm trying to remember what they call it G something. Oh, now I'm being silly. Um, so then the other thing he did is he took my book, 
um, I sent him the files. He took my book and he had it printed in India for me just as a sample. And it's got beautiful pages. The color, color is really bright and beautiful. And um, the, the pages, the quality of the, and the thickness of the pages is gorgeous. Um, I also have, how does the thickness of that, of your book compared to Ingram Sparks? So um, it's much better because Ingram Spark only goes up to a certain thickness. That's mm -hmm. like their premium. But with this, you can order, you can basically say how thick you want it to be up yeah. into up to 200 and i think with um ingram spark i'll double check but i think it's 100 or less is their top i think 100 might be the top um typical um china based printing um that others so you guys probably recognize this is jay maletsky's book um this is the china he he has his books printed in china and it's got some beautiful you know, nice quality. Um, the paper is great. So, but as I'm looking at this versus the India, I don't see a difference. If somebody gave me the two books and said, you know, which one was printed where, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know the difference, to be honest with you. So I, I look at this as potential way of combating what might be going on right now in China. Um, so not that the virus, the coronavirus isn't going to be elsewhere, but I'm just thinking it's another option. And, um, Pradeep is glad to provide quotes. If anybody is interested, just let him know what the size of your book and he can help you. Um, I think he's recommending like 130 or 150 for the thickness, but you can go up to like two, up to 200. Um, which is what he did for, I have one more thing to share. Okay, so he also included me this Pencil Master catalog, um, and he had this printed on 200 paper. So I can see like the highest level of thickness and quality, and it's amazing. It's really, really, really nice. So why not print all of your books on 200? Um, Wow, look at that. And this was printed with this, uh, with this partner. Why not print all the books at 200 and get the best possible quality? Well, it's going to be more, more heavy, so you'll pay more for shipping. So you want to have kind of a happy medium, right? You don't want it to be so expensive or, you know, perfect quality, but it might be overkill because you're going to pay a little more for the heaviness of the book. Make sense? So anyway, I wanted to share those different printing options with you, and I, I will be glad to help, you know, facilitate if you want, you know, pass you contact information for, um, for others, but um, we'll continue, you know, I'm sure that, that we'll be, everybody will be watching what's going on in, um, in China and with the, the publishing industry. There's no... I particularly like, I'm going to also grab you something else here. Hold on. Okay. So I have printed my books. These are my coloring books, print on demand. Now, I think the quality is beautiful. Now, I've heard other people say they don't like the quality of what um, comes out of KDP print on demand. But let me see if I can find a decent spread here. I can show. Um, I think the quality is great. The paper, the thickness of the paper, I would love it if they had a better choice of something a little bit thicker. Not because um, it's not perfect for coloring with crayons and, pe and, and pencils, you know, like colored pencils. It's perfect. But if somebody wants, like some of the coloring communities love to use these beautiful markers and the book, it's not, it's not going to hold up to markers. It'll bleed through. So for my newest book, I decided to 
have pictures only on one side. So if they wanted to use markers it, and it bleeds through, it's no big deal. So it, it shows pictures. Um, but if I was going to market my coloring book to an adult coloring community, I would probably want to have those paperbacks printed to, uh, through a printer and, and choose a thicker paper so that they could take their beautiful markers and, you know, make works of art out of the coloring pages without, you know, negative reviews. This is my uh, Spanish version. I just happened to grab this, but I have um, other versions of, of my books as well. Here is, um, this is the color, and this is all print on demand. So this is my paper, my Spanish paperback. Okay. Colors look good. Binding is good. It's got a nice shiny, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem cheap to me. I don't know. Other people say they have problems, but I can't, I don't see um, issues with, with that. Um, so let me stop for a second. I've got a couple of questions here. So Cindy says, is India cheaper than China? What printing companies do you recommend in the U.S.? Okay, so I have used, so is India ch cheaper than China? I don't know. I haven't compared yet the prices from India to China, but what I do know is if anybody is ready to do that, you can get um, pricing from China through the IAPC, which is J. Maletsky's company, he will he, he handles all the pricing and you can get it right on his website. So there's a place you can go to get that and then compare it with the same exact thing with Pradeep and see what happens with pricing. I have not gone that far yet. So my what I've been told is that yes, they're cheaper. Um, but I haven't been able to confirm that. So I've heard that from two different people. Um, one is Pradeep, another is uh, Gaurav, who is another um, Indian um, author who says that he has a connection in India that can print, and he says the pricing is much cheaper than China. So I have not held things in my hand from there, but what I've done is I've reached out to Gaurav and I've asked him which authors from, our, from the broader group that you know that I'm a part of with uh, Jay and Diane's group Facebook group which ones have has he printed for because what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and order a copy of the book because I want to hold it in my hands and I want to see the quality so that is um, an additional step that I'm going to take because I want to be able to give you guys some you know good feedback about what I'm seeing with quality um, on that Indian printer versus the one that, that Pradeep is sending. And who knows, maybe they're even the same printer. I don't know. But I'm still doing research there. Um, am I happy with the sales, Stella's asking, of my coloring book? Um, no. But I, I originally um, created the coloring book as a giveaway on my website. So um, I... I created it for the Labradoodle community and it was just going to be a downloadable thing where they could go and download um, a copy and sign up for my, for my um, email list. Uh, so then the Labradoodle community, if you don't already know this, is pretty fanatical. <laughs> so it went from uh, five or six pages to like 40 in no time at all, because everybody was like, oh, here's my picture of my dog. Here's my picture of my dog. Can you, can you, you know, can they be on a coloring page too? And then I was like, oh, I'll just put a book together and make it, you know, even more, more attractive to them. So I did that. And then um, they reached out to me and said, I really want to be able to order this so I can get a print copy to gift to so-and-so. My grandkids would love this. Can you get a print copy? So that's how I got involved with actually printing these coloring books. And now I've got three and I've got my fourth one being released, which is, um, is the companion to my join the club book. Um, so 
the ads, driving ads to coloring books is more expensive to me from what I've seen on Amazon. And this could be just, I can just share my own experience is I might pay $2 and sell $3 worth of, of uh, coloring books. So at a certain point, um, if Amazon decides that your ad is not profitable for them, then they will not allow you to run ads anymore. And I, that happens to me regularly with my coloring book ads. So I have um, kind of resigned my, I've pulled away a lot of the marketing on those coloring books. And I'm trying to put information inside of like the end of my books. Here's other top, other, other books available from Little Labradoodle Publishing. I'm also uh, trying to sell them on my website. And so I've kind of um, just adjusted my marketing approach. And marketing is not my strongest suit. So you'll see when we talk through the marketing topics, I will be bringing in experts from other areas to be able to talk through it. I have a lot to learn on the marketing side. So I would like to say that I'm doing wonderful with my sales of coloring books, but it, that's not the case. To me, a coloring book or the way I've used it is as a giveaway to gain a, um, an email address so that I can build my fan base and market to them. And also as a differentiator for my book. For example, if you know that my Puppy Pickup Day book also has a companion coloring book and also has a cute little plush, which I can't seem to put my fingers on right now. But so my book, I do the plush, the color, I have a plush, a coloring book, and a regular book. So when people are out there looking for gift ideas, I'm hoping that that is a differentiator that they will, you know, purchase my book and the coloring book and the, and the plush to put a nice gift set together for, you know, a birthday gift or Christmas gift. Okay. So, um, Spanish version, how do I do that? Um, so what I did is I found somebody who speaks Spanish. Now it was tricky because my book is a, it's a rhyming book. So I had to first go through and write it in prose and because I didn't want the individual who, you know, was a, it was an educator who spoke Spanish. So I wanted somebody good to, to be able to translate for me, but I didn't want them to translate according to a rhyme because it it's not going to sound right in a language that doesn't rhyme where it doesn't rhyme right so i went through and i i converted it into prose and then i and there are sites you can go on and you can have them take your book and i mean you can um post a job saying i need a i need somebody to translate my book into x so I've had mine done in Spanish, French, and Russian. I'm still, I haven't posted the French and Russian yet, but I will. Um, so, but I went through the process of taking that, those words and having them translated. And the way that I look at it is I've already paid for all these illustrations. So if I pay, I think I paid, well, one, one woman that, that translated for my Spanish didn't charge me anything because she was a big fan of my Labradoodle books. So she did that for no charge for me. But some of the others that I did, I think they were $50 a piece to translate. So for $50 plus the price to take the new translation text and lay it out for the new book. So that's about a hundred. So for $150, I had a whole new book and a whole new market with my same illustrations that I've already paid for. So that is something to be able to think about, right? Because there's, we have markets, we have other people out there who speak different languages and are just as interested in our topics. So for an extra $150 to get a whole nother book um, created and produced, that to me was a no brainer. Okay. 
So let me look at how are we doing for time here? Um, we're good. So I'm, I'm going over and um, for anybody that wants to hang out with me, we'll, we'll certainly do that. But I, I love the idea of being able to dig into all of your, you know, answer all of your questions along the way. So now if we talk about distributors and wholesalers, um, Bobby goes into it in much greater detail in her book. So I took some of the, the, the different sections of the book and tried to summarize it in these slides. So um, working with a distributor or wholesaler, if you want to do that, you're going to want to create an LLC for your book, uh, for your company. That way, um, you know, you have all of, you can benefit from all of the tax um, benefits and also the issues where if you are, if you want to protect your personal income, so you're becoming, um, you're becoming a business is basically what it is. Um, the also the thing that I found with distributors and wholesalers, and the reason I haven't done it yet, is because there's a ton of paperwork to fill out, and they want to see things like um, a huge number of sales. They want you to document all your sales. They want you to document your marketing plan, the results of some of the marketing that you've already done. So to me, these things are more for down the line after you've got a proven book that with really good sales. Um, Jay Maletsky just started uh, connecting with a distributor and a, and a wholesaler. So he's been, he's been doing this for a couple of years and has had amazing sales. So now he's opening up to being able to work with those, those wholesalers and distributors. Now, one thing you can do, which I highly recommend, is Ingram Spark is a distributor. So you can, when you go to Ingram Spark and you set up your, your paperback or your hardcover on Ingram Spark, they release it into their file that goes to all the retailers, it goes to libraries. Um, so you can get the benefits of distrib distribution without all the costs and paperwork and everything else that goes along with some of the others. Um, so when you post your book on Ingram Spark, you can, within a couple of weeks, you'll see the hardcover available on Amazon. You'll see it available at Walmart. You'll see it available at Barnes and Noble. So they distribute it to, and then retailers can order it from them. And so can libraries and they, they do. So that's a really good option until you're ready with much higher sales to go and with another distributor who may give you a better price or you know maybe you'll make a little more with a, another distributor. But there's a lot that goes into distribution and wholesalers. They take a lot of the profit, much like Amazon does. Um, they also uh, require you to pay shipping to them. So if you've got, you know, a big shipping order, a big order of books to go to the wholesaler, you have to pay for that shipping the same way we pay for it with Amazon if you're selling hardcovers through Amazon directly. Um, they also require you to take returns. So if somebody that purchases the book comes back, you know, a retailer says, I've ordered too many, I'm sending them back. The wholesaler wants you or the, the distributor wants you to accept returns or they'll just destroy them. But they basically charge you back for things that don't sell. So to me, I just avoid all of this. And I know that others, others will share with us and perhaps they've been more successful with distribution. Um, next time we have Bobby on, I'll ask her to, to talk about her experience with wholesalers and distributors because I know she does have more experience there. Okay. Um, other topics that I'm going to touch on briefly, but we're going to dig into more with some speakers that are coming is that if you're going to already have 
these beautiful books with words on pages, why not get the audiobook done as well? It's not expensive. Um, and there are people that um, I have used and I have, you know, a great deal of trust and respect for. Amy Weaver is, um, is one from WECOM. I'm going to have her speaking at an at a upcoming meeting. And I'm going to share with you the, the books that she has done for me, my audio um, books as well. <clears throat> I also have um, other inexpensive vendors. And what you can think about it in a few different ways. A book trailer is another way of taking audio and the visual nature of your book, because these are beautiful picture books, right? You can create a, have them create a beautiful book trailer um, starting around $40. So you can use that for marketing. You can use it for advertising. You can put it on your website. Um, I've seen as much as $100 for that, but between $40 and $100. Um, you can also have a gorgeous read aloud done of your book. And you can post that on YouTube. You can post it. Again, it's all about getting interest for your book. And there are a couple of different frames of mind when it comes to you know, do I do a whole read aloud or not? Um, there's one frame of mind that says, I'm not going to give away my whole book. I'll, maybe I'll record half of it and say, if you want to hear more, you know, go buy the book. So that's one thing. I tend to be of the mind that if kids and parents can enjoy a read aloud of my book and they really love it, they're going to go buy it as a gift for their kids because they're going to want a copy that they can hold on to and they can peruse. I love the idea of getting it in the hands of teachers who might want to share it with their students. So for me, I think that it's nothing but positive, but there, there is, you know, others that say, I don't want to do a read aloud because it's going to give my whole book away and then they won't buy it. I just don't, I don't believe that that's the case, especially when you're talking about birthday gifts, Christmas gifts, things like that. Um, I think people download ebooks and they look at read alouds, but when it comes time to buy something, if you really enjoyed the book, you're going to buy a physical copy. Um, and, and that's where these types of marketing, uh, will help. So, um, we're going to see a lot more of that because I've got a couple of people that are going to be talking to you about that. Um, the, there's also some discussions in the reading about pricing your book. I would just say, look at similar books. Like do, when I, I posted in this week about doing some research, what are your competitors going, uh, um, charging? What are, what are their covers look like? How many pages do they have? How, how are their illustrations? Um, how do you compare with them? And, you know, general, um, feedback, I would say if you've got paperback, $12.99 is probably a good starting place, but still do the research and see what others are charging. Um, the other is for hardcovers, you probably don't want to go any more than $17.99. Um, and typically it will be better if, you know, others will be selling a lot better at a lower price. The reason why I tend to start it higher is because with the Amazon, and I, I hope this isn't too confusing, when we set a price for Amazon, so I set my price for my Join the Club book at $12.99. It's a paperback. Now, if I drive a ton of sales, Amazon, um, as part of the agreement with Amazon, they're going to take 55% or whatever it is of that book cost and they're giving me a percentage right so if they see a lot of of potential with your book they're going to um lower the price and if they lower the price of your book say it's a hardcover from 17.99 they might lower it to 14.99 that three dollars difference comes out of amazon's pocket not your pocket so you still get the same, the same um, royalty. I would much rather see you driving sales when you're doing your book launch, like get a lot of people going, get that 
get Amazon's attention and let them lower the price of your book than to see you go in with a $14.99 price and then you know it's coming out of your pocket. You're you're losing out on some of that royalty. Okay. Um, a question from Aranda: Does Ingram Spark print that book on demand, or do you need to ship the books to them? They print on demand, so you don't need to do any shipping with with Ingram Spark. Um, Lois says to get into the Ingram Spark catalog, you need to pay eighty five dollars. Yes, there is a like it's a marketing thing. Um, you don't have to you don't have to get in their catalog. You can decide whether or not you want to. Um, but it is easy, Leah, it is easy to get set up with them. Um, they typically have a $49 charge to, for setup of your book. However, there are many um, coupon codes you can use to get, free, to get it for free. So that's what I, I always do when I'm helping to set up. I just find the, the coupon code and it's a free, free upload, free, free book setup with Ingram. The only bad thing, I will say the bad thing about Ingram is that the profits and the royalties to you are really low. It's not, it's, you're not going to make very much, um, but it's a good way to have a, pay, a hardcover available and to get distribution, get your book in the hands of these other places um, that you wouldn't otherwise have, but you might only make a couple of dollars a book. Don't expect to make six bucks a book. Okay. All right. Now let's go to, oh wait, did I cover this? Printing? Yes. <clears throat> Marketing. Um, this is our last slide. So I apologize for going over so much. We just had a jam-packed schedule today. Um, the marketing plan, we're going to be talking a lot. I did tell you guys that Marketing is not my strong suit. So I have a couple of individuals that I'm going to be bringing in to talk about marketing. Um, you've already met Lida McClellan when we talked about marketing um, using influencers. So she'll be coming back and talking more in general about marketing for your book and things like creating a marketing plan, um, writing a press release, creating a sell sheet, all of these things we're going to be talking about. I'm going to provide you with samples that you can use and ideas uh, for things. I've already shared my sample press kit that I created, um, which I took a, a workshop from Lida and I went through and created that, that um, marketing um, press kit. So that's something that you're more than welcome to take a look at what I did. Um, Tan Moy and his son were able to, to look at mine and created a beautiful press kit from this out for themselves using, I don't know if they used Canva like I did or if they used a different tool, but he was kind enough to post a copy of what he and his son did. So you can kind of take a look at, at other ways and other, other uh, views of what a press kit might look like. Um, one other thing that Mark, that um, will be really eye opening is when, when Lida shows you how to get media attention for your book. Um, where to find the, the um, folks who are going to be writing about your topics. How do you get their contact information? How do you get them to pay attention to your books and write about them and give you free publicity? So she'll be talking about that. I, I also posted links for you in the Facebook group where you can find previous discussions where she came in and presented on that. So if you're ahead of the group and you want to get a sneak peek of, you know, some of these future um, conversations that are coming with Lida, we've, we've kind of pre she's presented in the past on, on different aspects of it. So you can take a, uh, watch some of those videos. They're really great. And I did post them in, for, I think I posted them last week with links for marketing um, videos that you might want to, re to review and revisit. So I figure I'd rather give you more options to be able to dig in with expert speakers. Um, and I will try to get some new faces, but I also want to bring back some of the ones that were so beneficial from previous meetings as well. 
pre previous work groups. So I've talked way too much. Does anybody else need uh, have any questions? Oh, wait a minute. I do see some. Um, Leah says, yes, I need all the help and hand holding for a press kit and sell sheet. So I will definitely share some of your of the examples. And the really great thing is that you can use Canva and there are some great um, templates from Canva and it can really help you with that. And Lida is also going to be starting a work group, another work group, the one that I participated in, I do highly recommend, um, but she's gonna be kicking off another work group and at the end of it, you actually will able, be able to have yourself a um, press kit at the end of it. And lots and lots of contacts and lots of one-on-one -on -one time and classroom time, similar to this, but all around marketing and publicity and, and you know, your bit, your branding and your business and how to move forward. So it is definitely a very complimentary course that is well worth looking at as well. Okay. Anyone else have questions? All right.